we'll get going in just one more minute and we'll have Monica, our facilitator, kick us off. Well, it is 12 o'clock, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm Monica Ravosi, your facilitator, and welcome to our February 19th CVAC meeting. I wanna welcome all of our CVAC members, designees, staff, and everyone else joining today uh, via the meeting link or otherwise. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I want to do a couple of acknowledgements of designees today. So as usual, because we have such a large group, we ask that uh, CVAC members, you take a look at the list of members to see who all is here today. A uh, couple of notes for you today. Um, Matt Bell from Pacific Source will be on the phone in the beginning, so you may not see his name right away, but he will be joining us in time for voting. And also for part of the meeting, we'll be having Andy Grover, CEO of the Idaho Association of Schools, stepping in for Karen Echevarria. So just a couple notes there for you. Uh, with that, there's also a note on the slide that the advisory committee meetings are not required to adhere to Idaho Open Meetings Law. However, it is being conducted in the most transparent manner possible because we certainly understand the importance and value of that. And with that, I think we're ready to go to the next slide, which will review our agenda for today. So after I'm done with the overview, we will hear from Dr. Burgess and Elke shaw uh, on welcome and opening remarks and some updates for you. Then we will have a review of the votes that were taken between meetings that were, as you'll all remember, a continuation of the last meeting, the votes that we were not able to complete at the last meeting. So we will reveal those to you at that time. After that, we will hear on progress on the national and state level with regard to the COVID-19 vaccine. We'll be hearing from Dr. Hahn on the national piece and Elke Shatelik and Sarah Leeds on the state efforts with some good updates for you there as well. Next slide. Then we will uh, look at the further clarifications for Idaho Group 2 based on all the input that we've been gathering um, and really you know, bring those votes to you, consider them, discuss them as we need to so that we can figure out where those groups should fit and then move forward from there. A big part of our meeting today will be talking about our next steps to vaccine prioritization as we come into probably our largest group so far, uh, our largest groups. So we'll be talking about that, looking at some data, um, asking you to consider some different options so we can start to refine how we're going to approach group three and moving onward from there. And then last but certainly not least, we're going to have our day in the life section again like we did last time. Uh, so that you can hear about those vaccination administration realities. And today we'll be hearing from Amy Gamet uh, from Eastern Idaho Public Health District and Rob Geddes from Albertsons. And we actually might switch the times a little bit there and add a little bit more time up above, uh, leaving about 15 minutes or so for that day in the life section. And then we'll wrap up and talk about next steps from there. A uh, couple of very quick notes before we get started uh, with the welcome and opening remarks. Uh, we noted last time, and this worked really well, to try to limit our chat use in the meeting uh, to just some quick clarifying questions or whatnot, and really trying to focus uh, our meeting on dialogue and discussion live. So as much as possible, if you have comments or questions, um, CVAC members, if you could please raise your hand. As you know, you, we all know how to use the, the hands up function, I think, by now. Um, so press that and we'll acknowledge you and we'll we'll make sure that we hear from as many of you as we possibly can in the time that we have. Um, and again, just very quick clarifying questions maybe in the chat so that we don't have too much distraction there and we can really focus on our discussion together since we can't be together live. A uh, couple of other notes, we're going to use the hands up, uh, sorry, the megaphone function um, that you'll see next to the hands up. So we'll continue to do that today, but we will also have a, at least one polling question for you. So when we get there, we'll walk you through that so you're ready to do that as well. Final note for you today, we have discovered that if we begin voting before we announce that we're beginning voting, it sometimes will clear the hands up that are in queue, waiting, folks that are waiting to talk. So if you could please be very mindful of waiting until Dr. Burgess 
cues us to begin the vote and then place your vote at that time. I know sometimes you may already know before that, but please wait until that time. And uh, with that, I think that's all I need to share with you. I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Burgess and Elki Shatelek for welcome and opening remarks. Great, thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Monica. I will kick it off. Uh, just to, again, welcome you all here today. We um, are so appreciative of you taking the time to help support us in making recommendations to the governor's office on all of these really hard decisions that we have to make. Sometimes hard, sometimes um, entertaining, sometimes easy, but nonetheless, they're all very, very important. Um, so we have a lot to cover today, as you heard from Monica. Um, so get ready. We'll be going through quite a series of things as we, we trudge through today. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Burgers. Thank you, Elke, and wel uh, again, welcome. Thank you for all your work, especially the between meeting work, uh, but also attending the meetings, of course, and, and the excellent discussion that we've had. Um, we make better decisions when we do it all together. And um, uh, we, as you can tell, are continuing to revise our agenda to try to respond to both comments from you all and also comments from the public. So every time we look at this agenda, we try to try to make some adjustments for that. And then just a little reminder of our, our job overall is to make recommendations to the governor. The governor is the final decider of what, uh, what happens. And then, again, if we didn't have limited vaccine supply, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be uh, in the position of having to uh, work through these difficult uh, decisions. Um, so I think uh, we can go on to the next slide and just review. Uh, again, I'm not going to read the actions that we've already done, but uh, you have a list here of the work that we've accomplished in our previous meetings. And then since our, our last meeting, we did further clarifications on group one and group two, some of which, as Monica mentioned, we didn't have time for, so we had to do online between meetings. So we'll be announcing those to you uh, shortly. Then we have a few more clarifications. These are things that come either in public comments or directly to uh, the governor or health and welfare, a variety of methods where people want clarification on if they belong in a certain group. So we are going to vote on a few of those. And then, as Elke mentioned, um, and Monica both, a pretty big discussion on our approach to group three. And we have some votes we really need to take today because the governor's office uh, would really like that guidance. And I think uh, we can accomplish that today. So uh, next slide, please. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. This is just a reminder for me again, as we say every time that, that the meetings are open to the public. We love that transparency. We want to make sure that that we're really uh, letting people know how our, our deliberations are going. But that said, we will have public comments coming in only in writing and to our designated email box that you can see below. I'll read it out loud. It's COVID, the number 19, vaccine public comment at dhw.idaho.gov. So again, as a reminder uh, to members of the public and people listening in, if you want to submit comments to that email box, COVID-19 vaccine public comment at dhw.idaho.gov. Um, the comments that are received by the Monday prior to a CVAC meeting, that must be in by noon that Monday before for us to have time to get them out to CVAC for their considerations before the meetings. Um, also, I would like to point out, um, thank you very much to our ASL interpreters that are helping to support our meetings. And you can see on the side here that to, um, if you need to pin the interpreter videos, uh, you do that by scrolling over their video, clicking on the three dots in the top right corner of the video and selecting lock a participant to this location. Should you need the video larger, click on the layout option in the upper right hand corner, then click on full screen. Once the full screen appears, a floating window of the panelists will show. You can increase the size of the video by dragging and expanding. So next slide, please. All right, so let me review with you the votes that we did between, uh, between the meeting, because uh, we didn't finish them all at the end of the last meeting. So next slide, please. So as may, these are the votes that you may recall taking. Um, <clears throat> so 
The first one was um, a no vote on faculty and staff uh, being included uh, in the education. And we will be addressing this again because they will be included somewhere, so not to worry. And then similarly, all of these groups will be reevaluated in the subsequent uh, group that we are looking at. The next vote was also a no vote as far as library workers being included in that same education uh, group. Then the next uh, vote on Bureau of Reclamation Dam workers being included uh, down here in this uh, worker group uh, was a no vote, as was on-site apartment staff, Airbnb hosts, and hotel workers, and media covering the legislative session in person and other frontline reporters. So those were all uh, no votes. And then um, next slide, please. And Dr. Burgess, the one yes vote is highlighted. Oh, there we go. I was going to say, where's the where's my yes vote? Down at the bottom here, thank you. Down at the bottom was our yes vote on flight crews being included in, in group 2.3. So you can see them highlighted in yellow down there. So that, that concludes the votes that we did between meetings uh, from the last meeting. Okay, now we can move on. <laughs> I think we're ready for our uh, national and state uh, COVID vaccine progress update, starting with Dr. Han. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Just a few slides just to kind of get us oriented before you hear from the, from the state um, how we're doing here. Uh, next slide, please. Again, um, just showing you kind of the same uh, map. Um, these are doses of vaccine delivered um, per 100,000 population. Um, so you can see it does vary throughout the state. Again, um, the doses are being delivered based on adult population, not on the total population. And Idaho is 47th as far as our rollout per overall population. And you can see here some of the states that have receiving a lot more. Um, <clears throat> per capita, Alaska is the, Alaska got some preloading because of special challenges in getting uh, vaccine out there. Uh, but Connecticut, you can see for as an example, is the next highest state. So over 73 million doses have been delivered out to the states. Next slide. And these are administrations by state. Um, and you can see here, uh, we are currently ranked 39th in the country as far as administration per 100,000. So um, certainly doing relatively better than, and you'll hear more from uh, Sarah Leeds about this, but certainly doing well considering our low, uh, relatively low allocation. And I included this little box here. More information is now getting to be available on the CDC site. For example, you can see here total doses administered uh, Pfizer versus Moderna. So um, of course Pfizer got rolled out first, so it, re it remains a little bit ahead of over 29 million doses administered um, and over 28 million doses of Moderna administered um, so far. Next slide. Uh, I wanted to show you this because it's new. Um, you can see the link uh, below for, to the CDC site. Uh, I also got some population data from the Census Bureau. Um, this is just very first um, information. You can look on the left and see the age groups of people who've been vaccinated. Not surprisingly, um, seniors have received most of the vaccines so far. And this is um, largely due, of course, to the um, prioritization of seniors and especially in long-term care facilities. Um, and then you can see it going down from there with very few doses uh, going right now to younger persons, relatively speaking. The middle row, I wanted to highlight this as we start to focus uh, more on uh, looking carefully at equity. Again, this is national data, not Idaho data. Uh, but you can see here some of the differences with the, and I apologize that these slides are a little bit blurry. That is the way they come off the CDC site. I don't know why I couldn't, I could not get a better resolution from them. But um, you can see, for example, um, of white non-Hispanic population, 63.6% um, of vaccines have gone to that population, whereas they only re represent 60.1% of the overall population. And um, another striking difference is in 
black, non-Hispanic, um, uh, with only 6.2% of vaccines have doses have gone to black, non-Hispanic, uh, whereas they represent 13.4% of the U.S. population. So, and I'll let you look at the other, uh, some of the other differences there. Note, note that the multiple races is counted a little bit differently in these two data sources. So that might explain a little bit of the differences that we're seeing here, but nonetheless, we need to keep our eye on this. Um, and uh, we are starting to do so in Idaho. Uh, lastly, uh, you can see that more women than men have been vaccinated so far, and which is interesting because if you look at the national surveys, women apparently overall are more vaccine uh, hesitant. Uh, but I think this probably represents their overrepresentation, if you will, in um, long term care settings and also in the healthcare uh, sector. Um, next slide. I think that's my last slide. Yeah, so just as a reminder, we talked about this vaccine last time. So just as a reminder, this vaccine has now been scheduled to be discussed on uh, February 26th by the FDA's Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, otherwise known as VRBPAC, <laughs> and they will be meeting. And if they follow the same um, speediness that they did with Moderna, they may um, make a decision and issue a, the FDA may issue an announcement as soon as February 27th. Presuming uh, this vaccine gets authorized and indications are that it probably will from what is known so far, uh, then the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice will meet February 28th, that's a Sunday, and uh, they may need, they've also blocked out part of March 1st um, in case they need uh, two days to go over all the data and make some final recommendations. As a reminder, this vaccine, the efficacy overall is lower than what we've seen for Pfizer and Moderna, uh, but uh, the company has pointed out that they had a 85% efficacy against severe disease, um, and none of the um, none of their um, fully vaccinated people or fully vaccinated is vaccinated in their in this case with a single dose vaccine. Uh, measuring 28 days after vaccination, they had no hospitalizations or deaths um, in their vaccinated populations after uh, 28 days. So <clears throat> certainly seems very, very strong for severe preventing severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Uh, reminder, though, of course, this is very exciting that it is can be stored for long periods of time in refrigerator temperatures. It's a single dose. Um, but um, it did have a reduced efficacy in the South African cohort of their Essence study, which is their study that they did in uh, several countries. Uh, but again, even in South Africa, it did prevent hospitalizations uh, in, in South Africa, and they did not see any hospitalizations uh, 28 days after vaccination with this vaccine. I include this little cutout. Um, South Africa had to do a big switcheroo. Um, you may have realized they started off with AstraZeneca. That was their plan, um, but they uh, the vaccine showed such poor efficacy in South Africa that they have switched now to Johnson & Johnson. And and this might this might be largely due to the fact of their uh, variant strain uh, that was first identified in South Africa, and which you may be aware we just announced today in Idaho we have our first um, identified um, patient with a South African strain. So this is very relevant to us as we move forward in our discussions. That's all I had, and we'll turn it over to Sarah then to take it away. Or Elke, I think you're next. Sorry. Yeah. So everyone, I'm going to jump in real quick. I just wanted to ask you to hold questions on this part of the meeting because your questions might be answered as we go down through the meeting, but we may, we'll try to allow a few minutes at the very end to make sure we pick up any last minute questions that don't get covered when we have discussions earlier in the meeting. But if you could hold those questions during our updates, that would be great. And of course, we'll send you these slides afterwards so you can see all that great data that Dr. Han had for us. And with that, I'd like to turn over to Elke and Sarah Leeds to give us our state update. Thank you. So I'm just going to keep things at a very high level. If we go to the next slide, thank you. I wanted to touch base on a few things that we're doing across uh, the state to help support the, the rollout, the implementation efforts regarding vaccine. And then Sarah will get into more specific details. But just at a high level, um, we know that all the health districts are working very closely with all their providers across the state to um, manage that vaccine implementation and administration. Um, but we are also working with the Idaho Office of Emergency Management, with FEMA, and as well as a federal incident management assistance team uh, to come into the state to help us really look at our, kind of evaluate the capacity that we have here uh, for vaccine delivery, as well as assist with a plan for kind of the logistics of administration. So. 
um, not the, necessarily the, the development of a plan, but what would that look like? How many chairs would we need at a site and how many people would be required for X size of a, an event? So those types of logistics. And because FEMA is very well versed in doing those types of things, and this incident management action, incident management assistance team, excuse me, is um, a kind of a, a, um, a partner with FEMA, a kind of an, an arm of FEMA. Uh, we're also assessing the capacity and plans for vaccine administration modalities. So we're working with our health districts um, just to make sure that we're really capturing our readiness for this large group, 2.3, that's coming up. Um, that's the remaining frontline essential workers. There's uh, many different tactics that can be taken, of course, to um, manage the vaccine administration for those groups. Um, we're also looking at our readiness for group three and beyond, uh, as well as getting in additional vaccines. So, of course, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. Um, your votes are very important and your recommendations in helping us learn more about who we should be vaccinating. So then we can build out the how do we actually get the vaccine in arms of people in groups that you decide. And then lastly, um, you know, really based upon the experience with the age 65 and older large group that has come in, uh, the frustrations of uh, folks um, trying to get vaccine appointments um, and of course never having enough vaccine supply to meet the demand. We're also working on a statewide registration tool I um, will have more information in the, the coming meetings that we can share with you. I have, we're just really in the early stages of this, excuse me, <clears throat> but I'll be sharing more about that as time comes on. Next slide, I'll move it to Sarah. Thanks, Elke. Mm -hmm. So just giving an update of how many enrolled providers we have, <clears throat> and this is increased oh, just almost almost six percent since the last time uh, CVAC has met. Last time we met there were 399 provider locations enrolled across all the health districts. Now we're at 424 and you can see the breakdown here across all the health districts. About one-third of those and it's pretty consistent as we increase it stays about one-third so far are pharmacies. We have 30 41 provider locations in the process of, of enrollment. Um, and then to add to this, we are now the Retail Pharmacy Partnership Program. Um, CDC just let us know Wednesday afternoon that we're adding a third group that includes about 30 pharmacies. Some of them are already enrolled, um, but they're managed by a parent company called Cardinal. And so they will be um, coming on board as the as part of the retail pharmacy partnership program. So Idaho still remains poised um, across the state with a lot of providers ready to administer vaccine as we increase our allocations. <clears throat> Next slide. Thanks. So this is um, a, a very recent uh, slide from Tiberius and Operation Warp Speed provided this to us at a recent meeting, um, and this is uh, where we rank with percent of delivered doses that are administered, and we are at 81%, um, which is is pretty good. We're doing we're doing really well, um, especially compared with our other states for doses administered um, that have been delivered in the state. Um, next slide, please. So um, some other really important things to know is um, there are two, two things when, as we look at increases in doses. So as of Tuesday, February 16th, um, it became official that uh, the federal government is counting a sixth dose in every Pfizer vial. So previously they had been counting five doses per vial. And so a tray had 975 doses. Um, but as we all learned really quickly in those, that first week of, of administering Pfizer vaccine back in December, many, many providers were getting you know, a sixth and sometimes even a seventh dose out of a Pfizer vial. And um, it became official that we are counting that sixth dose. So now a tray of Pfizer uh, 
one tray has 1,170 doses in it. So, so while it, when we, it, that would look like an increase and it really isn't because providers from the very beginning were told, please do, you know, and use that dose, don't waste it. Um, but now the federal government is counting that as inventory. However, the good news for Idaho is that we are, we've seen a, a real um, increase of 25% um, in Pfizer doses this week, um, which accounts for about three, for three trays, which is 3,510 doses um, coming into the state that is above and beyond um, what we've had. And so we also were notified that there's increases in the allocation in the Federal Pharmacy Partnership Program. Um, next week, there will be 2 million doses distributed across the country through that program. Last week, uh, there were 1,000 doses and 1 million doses. And what that meant for Idaho was about 5,000. So, you know, keeping their, they haven't changed their pro rata allocation. So we're anticipating 10,000 doses. Um, about 5,000 Moderna doses and, and 5,000 Pfizer doses because uh, the new addition, uh, the second 1 million in the Federal Pharmacy Partnership will be Pfizer doses. Um, so again, we're adding cardinal chain pharmacies to what we've already been, who we've already been working with as Walmart and Albertson Savon. Um, and then just Kind of quickly, it's been in the news all week. Extreme weather conditions around the country have impacted shipments this week. Um, there have been, as of yesterday, there were no shipments that had left manufacturers um, this week. And so we do uh, anticipate that in eastern Idaho, there um, could be some Pfizer trays that are delivered on Saturday. Um, and there have been some impacts um, around the around the state um, in terms of canceled appointments for that. But those those doses will ship as soon as um, as soon as the federal government, you know, with, as soon as the manufacturers can get people to those sites and get the shipments ready for delivery. So we are looking at a large um, influx of doses next week to account for this week. And so we are. Really, really, we're staying on it. There, we have some staff right now in a meeting um, this afternoon. You know, we've had daily weather meetings with CDC about about how it's impacting shipments. And so, we know that if we don't get shipments by Monday, um, you know, we'll, a lot of our providers will will have some significant uh, appointments to reschedule. Um, but but we're hoping that shipments can go out over the weekend and be delivered um, as soon as possible, preferably Monday. So next slide, please. So the another more good news is that we are now getting in Tiberius, which is our micro planning tool through the Department of Health and Human Services, three week forecasts for Pfizer and Moderna. And this is what they look like in that micro planning tool. And so as you can see, we've got total doses and the breakdown of Pfizer first doses, Pfizer second doses, and um, both first and second doses for Moderna as well. <coughs> and so, so it's looking good. As you can see, we're, we're seeing some increases, um, you know, it's particularly with second doses. Um, and then as, as we talked about, we expect the Janssen vaccine to be in Idaho and across, you know, approved for use across the country that first week in March. And so that's what we're preparing for. Um, but we do not expect to see three week forecasts in those early weeks of Janssen. So, um, you know, they're, they're gonna be distributing smaller amounts and then ramping up. What they've told us is um, we should expect about 100 million doses of Janssen in the United States um, through June. And so, you know, like they said, it'll be weekly smaller amounts in the very first, first few weeks and then ramping up from there. So um, given the way it's worked in the past, I don't anticipate we'll get um, three week forecasts for that for a little while, but, but maybe. So, 
Uh, I think that is my last slide. That's great. Thank you. Sarah. Sarah. All right, with that, I think we're ready to move to our next item on the agenda, which is uh, further clarifications for Idaho Group 2. And Elke, if I can make a couple comments real quick. Um, we we are not, not taking questions so that we can get the meat of our work done, which is which is about what we're about, about to do. And then we'll, again, do questions at the end. And one thing I wanted to dovetail on what Sarah said, we have learned um, from the CDC that there's some flexibility in that second dose. Uh, it can be given a little bit later. So hopefully this weather delay, um, people can be reassured that it'll still be effective to get their dose um, despite the weather delay. And then uh, Dr. Han showed how we rank uh, per capita, but we did see uh, yesterday, if you rank us on that distribution that Sarah showed where we are 81%, that actually puts us 18th among states as far as delivering the percent of vaccines that, we, that we've been given, which I think is a much more fair measure than per capita since we are getting 47th, we're 47th in the country of what we're getting per capita. Um, anyway, now we're going to go ahead and clarify, um, do some more, for, more clarifications that have come through for group two. All right. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. And we'll go to the next slide. So we've done this several times before. Just drawing to your attention again that as we go through our votes coming uh, in the next few slides here, we're going to take you through a series of five clarifying votes on group two. Uh, it's information that came in uh, and feedback that came in through our, our portal, through a variety of mechanisms. Dr. Burgess already talked about that. But as we walk through those five votes, just keeping in mind our programmatic goals and our other considerations around limited supply, our epi data, and logistics. Next slide. So we're going to do so exactly. May I add one other thing? I just oh, completely forgot to add. Of course. Too. Yeah. It's a busy meeting. Here we are on the fly. Um, so I want to also make sure that I, I'm, I'm clear with folks. We've talked about it before that just a reminder, we're bringing the votes to you that um, that really need that clarification. We get a lot of input, um, as I have said, and as you've seen in the, the materials that you get sent. Um, just as a reminder, again, that we we those all of those votes that come in or requests that come in are first before they come to you mapped against CDC and CISA um, guidance and criteria. So those, the inputs that come in that fall uh, logically within certain groups because of CDC and CISA, um, we do not bring those votes to you. So that's just a reminder that lots of things come in, but we're bringing those to you that just need further refinement. Okay, now I'm finished. I'm sorry. Thank, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so this is, should be pretty familiar for you. Uh, what we're going to do is present uh, the, the group that's asking for clarification. We'll have a discussion. Again, try to raise your hand so we can have verbal discussion more than chat, unless you have just something simple you want to throw into chat. Then we'll vote. And we're just going to do a simple majority. If it's really unclear, uh, the, the governor will be the one to make the final decision no matter what. And the governor will see uh, both the discussion and how the vote came. So your, your discussion and your vote will still be meaningful. Uh, it's always nice if we get to a majority. And we have been pretty successful at that uh, so far. So I think with that, we'll move into the first group. So this is um, up in first responders. Um, so 2.1, we want to clarify that instructors for CPR and other basic life support be included under first responders and safety. Uh, we have been trying really hard to give you population estimates, but for this group, we don't really have a good population estimate. We did want to point out that in the vaccine areas, uh, they do have to have uh, CPR and basic safety life support uh, when they're watching people after they receive the vaccine. So that, that's one other part of the consideration. So I will open this up for discussion. And again, don't vote until I ask for the vote. So right now we're in discussion phase about this group and whether they belong in the first responder category. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. So now we're opening it up to questions and discussions on this group. I'm watching for hands up. I don't see any. Oh, here we go. Mel Levitin, please go ahead. 
Yeah, this is Mel. Um, Dr. Burgess, I just wanted some clarification because it was my understanding, and I realize that may be limited, um, that vaccinators were going to receive the vaccine already. Um, so, and, and it sounded like, I don't know, that, that they're training up new people to do that, but if they're vaccinators, aren't they getting the vaccine? I believe so. I know that's the case at uh, my vaccine site. I guess I don't know for sure if that's a requirement, um, but um, we, we um, I think, I don't know if other people can speak to that, if that's happening everywhere that the people in the vaccine areas are, are being vaccinated. And uh, just a note here from the chat that might be relevant here is a question uh, for Dr. Keller. Aren't almost all CPR instructors already first responders? So I'm wondering if that's somewhat related anyways. You know, I don't think we, we don't have a good population estimate, but I, I would say anecdotally, a lot of people that teach CPR happen to already be, just like you said, EMTs or medical healthcare professionals. So I would say there's, I would say there's a lot of overlap. Okay. If anyone has any further insight to provide on that, if you want to put your hand up or any other questions or discussions on this vote. I'm not seeing right. anything. Are we ready? I think so. <laughs> All right. So now is your chance to go to your little megaphone and vote a yes or no about including this uh, group and first responders. And as a reminder, just voting members. Yes. yes. Thank you. All right. I think we're getting quite close. It's going to be a clear one. All right. I'm going to go ahead and announce it, understanding the numbers might change slightly. Still, but currently we have three yes, 25 no. All right, so we will send that recommendation on uh, to the governor. Next slide, please. Okay, this next group is uh, in the community, kind of in the same first responder category, but under community food, housing and relief. Do we want to clarify that the Red Cross Emergency Operations Center workers be included in that group? And we do have a number, if you see down in the blue box here, that would be 259 people. And I, didn't, I did forget to say, um, you know, if they're not included here, all of these votes, they will be discussed, you know, later on in our, in our next categories. So open for discussion on this group. So far, I'm not seeing anything, but I want to give folks a a moment think about it. Dr. Hudspeth, go ahead, please. Uh, my question is, what does this group actually do? Are these in the office or who are these people? So did everyone hear that? Dr. Hudspeth asked, what do these folks actually do? Are they in the office or what kind of roles do they have? So um, I don't know if somebody else wants to chime in. We talked about this would be, um, you know, I, in my mind is Texas yeah. where there's a, a disaster and they come, they are helping with food, housing, um, that type of thing. And, and uh, Dr. Chris Carter put information in the chat that says 259 is the total frontline essential workers for Red Cross in Idaho. Um, not just the emergency operations center, the EOC if activated would be virtual. Thank you, Dr. Carter, for that. That's helpful. Any other questions on this one? I, uh, Christine Newhoff, go ahead, please. Yeah, just a clarification on the clarification. So, <laughs> um, since it, uh, Dr. Carter said uh, 259 is the total frontline essential workers, and our question is about the emergency operations center workers, are the others already included? in this uh, group and it's just the virtual operations center folks that we're voting on or are we looking at all of their frontline essential Red Cross workers who it seems like the ones who are actually providing housing and food probably already fit. 
That is one that um, Dr. Carter, if you can unmute yourself and maybe help us with that clarification. I think we also had a maybe a clarifying slide that we can pull up as well. Hi, yes, but we the Red Cross had um, 259 workers total that they considered frontline essential that included, for example, the group that was um, you just voted on. So some of those CPR, AED, and basic life support workers were part were um, with the American Red Cross, but clearly they're not all with American Red Cross. This was a next specific group that they um, called out um, specifically requesting that they be put um, in this category. Great, thank you for that clarification. Hope that helps. Uh, we have uh, Mel Levitin with her hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, I just I just have a concern really um, is that once once we include the Red Cross Emergency Operations Center workers, then if a if a, you know another natural disaster is declared where we need shelter, food, or whatever, then then are we going to need to add the rest of the volunteer organizations active in disaster? Because that number starts getting pretty big. Um, and so that's that's my concern is once it starts to snowball. And the more we snowball and expand numbers, as we've already seen, the longer it's going to take to get um, at-risk populations vaccinated. All right, any uh, response or clarification on Mel's comment? Or perhaps it is something to keep in mind. I'm just checking to see if there's anything in the chat on this, although we are trying to keep it live and thank you everyone for, for doing that. All right, I don't see anything else at the moment. No hands up. All right, Dr. Turner, are we ready to vote? See, uh, I see that there's some activity in the chat. Are we ready to vote based on yeah. what you're saying or is there anything else we need to bring forward? Um, so, um, Monica, the, the questions are, are very specific um, about CPR instructors and being first responders and um, whether or not the um, Emergency operations center workers would be on site or, or virtual if activated. And um, if in case other people have that question, a lot of times they are on site, they're not able to work virtually. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that. Just wanted to make sure we covered everything this before is, we turned to focus. Chris, and I just want to say we specifically asked Red Cross the question about emergency operations center. If it were activated now, would it be virtual or not? And the response was it would be virtual. Thank you. All right, it looks like with that, we are ready uh, to go ahead, Dr. Burgess. All right, so back to your little megaphone, please vote yes or no about this group being included in this first responder group. We're watching those votes come in. I think we're getting close. All right, I'm going to go ahead and announce it, understanding we might have a slight change still, but we have currently five votes for yes and 23 votes for no. Six and 23 now. All right, so we will relay that on, and I think we have another couple groups to vote on. So let's go to the next group. So we're still in that same category, uh, first responders, community food, housing and relief, but this is the Social Security, I can't say this, Social Security Administration staff uh, who cannot telework and are serving vulnerable populations. And so I have a little more detail on that um, to share. So uh, they do dire need interviews, emergency paper checks, hand deliver uh, information, in-person identification checks, 
so that's the type of uh, work that we're talking about. And the number that we're looking at here are 27 that cannot telework and do that type of work. So I will open that up for discussion. And this is Chris. I just wanted to comment that uh, their original request was for um, a larger number of people um, who were in offices and in follow-up, they pared it down to this um, smaller number who were they felt were very critical on-site working with vulnerable populations. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Mal Levitin, go ahead, please. Just a question. Uh, um, the self-reliance workers also do very similar type of work uh, with the Department of Health and Welfare. And I'm just curious, have, have they gone, because I can't remember, I apologize, have, have we already put them in the pool? Are they getting vaccinated? I, I don't remember that they are, and the work is very similar. So that's my question. Are, are they? Does anybody remember? It's a good question, and I'm having the same foggy memory problem. Is there anyone else on the call who can answer, speak to that question? I'm sorry, could you repeat the it was group? Compliance work. Yeah, I apologize. So in, in um, my experience, the, this type of work that you're talking about for um, Social Security is very similar to what self-reliance workers do with the Department of Health and Welfare as far as dealing with vulnerable clients, dealing with paperwork, identity verification, that type of thing. And I just, I don't remember if we um, have already voted to approve that group of people for getting vaccines. I, I apologize, I just don't remember because the two lines of work are really similar. And if we don't know, we can take that offline and, and you know, either bring it back for a vote or bring back the information. Uh, but point well taken. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Carter, any you other? Have... Sorry, sorry, Dr. Burgess. I just wanted to check if Dr. Carter had anything else to add on that one. No, to my knowledge, that group has not come to a vote for CVAC. Thank you. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Dr. Burgess, please. That's quite all right. Um, any other discussion on this group? Okay, I don't see any at all at the moment. I don't see anything in the chat either. So um, go ahead and make your vote on yes or no about including this group in the first responder category. It appears this one might be a little closer, watching the numbers. All right, I think we're very close at this point. So we have 16 yeses and 11 noes. Okay. Well, that's the majority. So we're going to take that and move forward. We have two more of these before we get into some other meaty discussion. So the next one is a little bit different category, 2.3. And do we want to include plumbers in 2.3 as frontline essential workers? And you can see in the little blue box, plumbers, pipe fitters, steam fitters, and helpers, uh, approximately 2,050 people. So um, open for discussion. All right, questions, comments about including plumbers in 2.3. Yvonne Ketchum Ward, go ahead, please. Just a clarification, this says subset of essential. Is the, are the plumbers also a subset of all plumbers? Um, uh, Yvonne, this is Elke. I, the line is just indicating that they would go in part of 2.3. It's not pointing to any particular line, and this did not specify a subset of plumbers. It came in as all plumbers, unless Dr. Carter tells me otherwise. Okay. 
No, that was came in as all plumbers. Okay. And keep in mind that this is an occupation, um, and there are plumbers who might be under in within water utility workers, and if they're in that subset of water utility workers, they would be included there um, or elsewhere. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions or comments or discussion on this one before we go ahead and vote? And Amy had commented, Amy Gamet had commented or asked a question if there's only, oh, 2050 statewide, but I'm hoping uh, Dr. Carter may have clarified that. Okay. So that's the survey estimate. Okay. okay. So there, there are subject to the limitation of surveys and confidence intervals around surveys. Thank you. Uh, Christine Newhoff, please go ahead. So uh, just a couple of questions that will probably be easy for someone uh, to answer. Uh, one is that um, assuming that somebody has a, uh, a pipe break in their house, so have a have a big leak inside their house. It would be a private plumber and not a water utility worker that comes to repair that. Is that correct? I see Elke nodding. And, and then the other question is, uh, I recall that we were shown um, rates of uh, exposure or risk for various occupations okay. early on where plumbers very high risk. It does seem they would be going into a lot of individual homes to do their work. Who can comment on that one? Dr. Turner, I think you presented that data, but I don't, re I don't recall and I don't know if you have it at your fingertips. So, um, yeah, plumbers was not a specific occupation that was called out in the data I presented. Um, and I don't think we could find it quickly enough um, before the vote unless you want to delay this one while we look. Well, we have, oh, Dr. Let's, let's stick with that first question. Uh, doc, Dr. Burgess, do you want to add anything there before we take other comments? I don't think so at this time. Okay, all right, let's go to Dr. Wyatt, please. I feel that plumbers should be able to appropriately socially distance and wear masks. And based on what they do and their potential exposure, even in other people's homes, I don't see the, how they would be a high risk population. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on this, on this question, this vote? All right, I don't see any at this time. Dr. Burgess? All right, well, let's go ahead and take a vote. Um, so please vote yes or no about this group being included in 2.3. I think we're ready to announce the vote. We have zero yeses and we have 28 noes. All right, well, that's pretty clear. Uh, let's go to, I think, our last one of this group. And this is more of a general vote. Um, so this is janitorial and cleaning staff. Should they be included in the sector in which they work? And remember, we had a couple of votes about uh, being in the sector in which they work before and had some discussion about that previously. Uh, we do not have a number um, to to share, um, so I would open this up for discussion. And Dr. Burgess, this is Elke. I would add it for a reminder, those two votes that we took, one was for interpreters, um, and then and that was a yes vote, so they are included in there now, and then the other one that we voted no on was around construction workers being included in the sector in which they work. So those are the two that you voted on last time. Thank you, Elke. Questions? Go ahead. And, and I just wanted to comment that they were um, already, some of them have been included. For example, when we look at the healthcare settings or school settings, as all staff were included in those rollouts. 
Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments for consideration on this? Mel Levitan, go ahead, please. Yeah, this is Mel. Just a comment. Uh, the, the people who clean our building and the buildings around us clean also for several developmental disability agencies. And so it could be pretty easily across the state for those numbers to really grow um, and those folks to get vaccinated again before people who are at higher risk. And, and I just have a concern about what that number could could quickly expand to. That's, that's all. Thank you. So I'll ask us, is there anything in the chat? Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Turner? Nothing in the chat. Okay. All right then. I think we're ready to go ahead, Dr. Burgess. Okie doke. So everybody uh, go ahead and grab your little megaphone and vote yes or no about this group being included in the sector in which they work. We're going to have a close vote here, it looks like. Currently, we have 14 yeses. Well, right now, we have 14 yeses and 14 noes. The number just changed again. Wow. And we do have 28 members present. Thank you. Thank you, Misty. Our first time. Well, I think, I think we had decided we were going to send this information on to the governor unless anybody feels differently. Um, and, and I say that partly because um, we have a lot to cover <laughs> today, and I, I don't know that we want to spend a lot of time. I do think the governor, will, you know, again, he'll review our comments and he will come to a conclusion. Um, and I, I think the points that are challenging are some of these folks are already included, as was mentioned, and some cover multiple different uh, facilities. So um, it's a challenging group. Um, Dr. So Burgess? We'll yeah. Sorry to interrupt the vote. Your tally vote. just changed to 15 yes and 14 no. Okay. Well, again, the governor will get that information yep. and he will make his decision based on what he what he thinks. Um, so we are going to go to our next section, which is um, pretty big decisions we have to talk about with group three. And so um, uh, we're going to, Elke and I are going to kind of go back and forth to kind of give you some information to set up this discussion. And we ha we do have some votes that we need to get to at the end of this. So um, I think Elke has the next slide. I do. Thank you. So <clears throat> this is my opportunity to sort of ground you on what we have um, over the course of time sort of left on the table. You've seen this slide a couple of times looking slightly different. But these are two groups, uh, sorry, these are they're basically two segments here that have been um, kind of pulled together based upon the ASIP change with moving frontline essential workers up that we adopted. Um, and so this is what was slated for us to look at for group three, and it is based on ASIP phase 1C. So as you can see, it's persons aged 16 to 64 years of age with medical conditions that increase the risk for severe COVID-19, and then all other essential workers. You can see that that long list on there. Um, I do want to make sure that I point out that that when we start looking at essential workers, which will not be today, we're not going to get into a lot of detail and votes on that, but we have a lot of input that comes in on the essential workers group, um, that we have some some pretty meaty conversation to have um, as we move through this next section. So I'm going to hand the next slide over to Dr. Burgess. So we're, we're going to review some background for you to give you, you know, both reminders and information to help you with the vote. And that background will be um, a lot of what's happened with ASIP 
And also, uh, we're going to give you a little bit of information about what some other states have decided to do, so you can kind of weigh that in. And then we're going to have a couple rounds of voting. The first round will be to pick one of four approaches, and you'll see it'll become more clear as we show you the ASIP recommendations. And then um, we have a completely different approach, again, uh, looking at what some other states have done. And then the second round, we'll be talking about some population groups that we haven't yet talked about, again, based on what some other states have done. And then we'll introduce to you some considerations for our next meeting about clarifications with the other essential workers. So that's kind of the work that we're about to embark upon. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So I'm going to take you through the, the next round of slides because just as a reminder, we had sort of two, two groups, if you will. We have the, the people with high risk medical or medical conditions that put them at high risk and the other essential workers. So we're going to focus this next little bit on what that means for uh, people with medical conditions. So as you look at this, this next series of slides, um, this is some stuff that winds up becoming very challenging and, and, and things to think about and really kind of laying, laying the, the foundation for you that, that getting precision on population estimates becomes a challenge when we get to this. So as you can see um, from this slide, from according to CDC, this is the list straight off their website of medical conditions that are considered by CDC to increase the risk of severe illness from the COVID-19 virus. Uh, so as you can see on here, um, the people that have cancer, chronic kidney disease, COPD, Down syndrome, heart conditions, and there's a list, immunocompromised states, obesity, severe obesity, pregnancy, sickle cell disease, current or former smoking, and type two diabetes. So I'm putting emphasis on some of those for a reason. So as we get to the next slide, so these are the same, it's the same list with some highlighted colors on here. So um, in case it's challenging to, to see, um, there's not one single data source where you can go to find the population estimates for each of these. Uh, we do have information from our Idaho Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or BRFIS, that you can see in blue. And then for the conditions, medical conditions that are highlighted in green, um, there are one, two, three, four of them. So cancer, Down syndrome, sickle cell disease, and smoking. It, there are multiple other data sources. So we're, we're pointing these things out because getting clear population estimates for you um, it be, becomes a challenge, as I've said probably three, three times now, sorry. Uh, next slide, please. So um, like you, I pointed out in the slide previous, the blue was what we can collect through BRFS, BRFSS, and then this green is where you start seeing um, different population estimates uh, from different sources. And so Aside from the, those people who are former smokers, you can see that accounts for about 20,000-ish um, individuals. Next slide, please. It'll become hopefully more and more clear as we go through. Um, so again, I want to point out, if I haven't said it enough yet, it's challenging to have those accurate population estimates to help inform you of, for your um, considerations. And then again, no single data source. So what we're going to present to you um, in terms of people with high-risk medical conditions, we want to be able to break it out by age demographics so we can show you some, some information to help inform your vote. We selected key, um, or, so we selected certain conditions that are in this list that we knew we had um, more, I guess, robust data on by age group. And I, I have Dr. Carter on standby in case I'm saying any of this incorrect. Um, but hopefully this will be a little bit clearer as we move even to the next slide. So we wanted to be able to, to give you options here to look at people with, high, with medical conditions placing them at high risk. We want to be able to break them out into a couple of different age groups. So again, this slide is representing by age group based upon our BRFSS estimates, and I, we have a footnote down at the bottom for you, um, the numbers uh, with those select conditions 
um, by age grouping, if that makes sense. Hopefully we're, getting, we're just like kind of winnowing this down a little bit more and a little bit more. So if we wanted to look at the whole Idaho adult population, well, age 16 to 64 with medical conditions, it would, it would be um, more, uh, obviously, than this group here combined, um, but we don't have all of those refinable estimates. But it gives you the general idea, and I don't know that we would be too terribly far off, um, except for when you get to people who are former smokers, which is, was a large number you saw on that last slide. So before, I, before we move on, um, which is when we're starting to get into what our, our um, tee up for our vote is, I'm going to ask Dr. Carter if there's anything that I misrepresented in my review here. No, I think you represented it very well. Phew, because that was stressful. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the next slide and hopefully that it will start making more sense. Over to you, Dr. Williams. So, so this is what we've lined up for you. Um, and remember I told you we're going to give you a, a one vote between some choices here. So if you look at choice A, um, the ACIP recommendation right now is to put um, the 16 to 64 year old group with high risk medical conditions and the essential workers in together. So the data that Elke just reviewed in Idaho, our best estimate would be that would be 380,811 people. So that would be one option, would be to just align with ASIP and, and make that our next group three. And then vote B would be a subset. Um, as you saw, she showed you the 50 to 64 year old age group with at least one high risk medi medical condition and the essential workers. And if you look at that, the number would be 251,208. Choice C would be to take that subset, the 50 to 64 year old group with a high risk medical condition before the essential workers. And that would be the next group being 168,364. Now, choice D is a very unique choice, but this has been implemented by some states and discussed around um, Idaho. Um, and there's a couple reasons for this. Uh, but the main reason is those of you that are vaccinators probably are thinking to yourself, how am I going to prove that somebody has an essential medical, uh, excuse me, a high risk medical condition? Uh, as we know, even the essential workers have been somewhat of a challenge. So, um, you know, the logistics of that might be complicated enough that people might say, let's just do it by age only. If we did that, then we would, we would go to, as you can see, a breakdown. Those age 55 to 64, you can see, would be the next group, 218,000, and so on as we went down the line and opened it up by age. Uh, we would be in chunks of about 200,000 each with the 18 to 24 being the slightly smaller at 164,000. So uh, let's um, have some discussion around this because this is a pretty big recommendation to send to the governor uh, on how to move to the, the next group and time sensitive because these discussions are actually happening as we speak. So thoughts. All right, questions, comments, discussion. Yvonne, catch on board. Go ahead, please. I know it's not one of the options, but it seems like the smoking category really inflates <laughs> the, the different A, B, or C. And so I'm wondering if a, a different option we could consider, uh, and I'm not dissing on the smokers, that's not, that's not my intent. It's just the numbers get so large that it's going to be hard to get everybody through this, the, the tunnel. Um, if we did everyone that has these medical conditions and essential workers and then put the smokers into their age category, it seems like that might be more manageable for the providers um, to say, you know, if you're a smoker, you get to go, but you're going to have to go with your age category. And I'm just solely doing that based on the volume of people that this will create. Do 
thank you for that. Any reactions quite, uh, to that? Yeah, and uh, um, let me clarify just, just to make sure. So that what you see on this chart in terms of population numbers um, for either the 16 to 64 or 50 to 64, um, those numbers are for current smokers. We don't have folded into that former smokers, which is a larger number. Thank you for the clarification. All right, I think we're going to move on to our next comment. Uh, Ryan Whitlock, go ahead, please. I thought Dr. Burgess explained it very well and, and very simply in terms of how do we verify these people and which group they fall in. And I think the easiest way to do that is simply by age. Like it's going to be a, a challenge whether you're at a, a pharmacy at Walmart or um, any other provider site to try to figure out are you, you have one or more of these medical <laughs> conditions. Um, are you a current or former smoker? I'm not sure we want to put our folks in the position of trying to sort through and, and uh, categorize people like that. I, I don't know what other states have done that D option, but it seems like the cleanest and the easiest to me. Thank you. Dr. Wyatt, go ahead, please. Yeah, one question I have would be maybe to Dr. Han. Uh, it was a couple of meetings ago, she presented the data where we looked at uh, morbidity and mortality by age group in those. And it really does correlate pretty well with the higher the age, the higher the risk of severe illness or complication. And even when you get down into the, the 20 to 35 year olds with some medical conditions, we're not seeing the death and stuff in those groups, even with those medical conditions. And I just can't envision the software required to determine whether somebody meets criteria to even schedule an appointment or not. So maybe we could look at that data again to see really what the, the, uh, the risk is in those populations, because it might correlate nicely with the age group data. I'm having a little heartburn just thinking about essential workers because this group is going to be lobbied by every potential employment group in the state to determine whether they qualify as essential worker. And, and really, if there's not a real reason to do that and we have good data to support an age-based approach, it seems like that would be the simplest all around. Thank you for those comments, Dr. Wyatt. Dr. Turner, if you, I think it was, I think it was you who may have brought that data to us before. I can go on to some other questions, but if you happen to have that at your fingertips and can bring that back in to help answer some of those questions, um, perhaps we could do that. Yeah, um, Monica, this is Chris Hahn. Uh, Kathy just texted me that she had a phone call, so I'm covering the chat and I'll, I'll respond here as well. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Cassie, for that comment. You're, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, if you look at severe outcomes, it's there's a very clear correlation with age that's, and in some ways that is by far the simplest way. Um, you know, almost any provider would feel comfortable um, using an age-based criteria. Uh, you know, the question just comes down to, as you well know, that, that that whole question of equity with um, people who might be a little bit younger, but have other reasons to be at higher risk. Um, and why don't I, will talk with Kathy after this call. And if, if people aren't ready to vote, we can certainly bring more back comparing really the age-based risk versus the condition-based risk that might be, um, or, or just the risk for, of being an essential worker. How much risk does that add? Thank you so much, Dr. Hahn. I think we're going to go then to uh, Mel Levitin, please. Yeah, so I would just like to point out the reason we don't have data, hard data on people with disabilities is because we don't collect as a country health data related to this issue um, related to death, we we have pretty good documentation that people with intellectual disabilities are more likely to live in some type of um, group housing. So one to eight people living in a home. Those two person residential habilitation settings don't qualify as congregate housing. So those folks have not been vaccinated yet. Um, again, they don't, we don't pull that kind of data. Um, a, a paraplegic or a quadri quadriplegic that has um, reduced lung capacity, they don't show up on this list because this, this, this information isn't collected. 
Um, so I, in the in the hunt for for data, I would just really want to point out that the reason we don't have data on people with disabilities is because it's not collected, not because the issues don't exist. The other thing is, I totally get that the vaccine rollout has just been really difficult for the for the providers to get that vaccine to to folks and and that it's a work in progress but um you know the fact that we get to people with chronic health conditions and disabilities and then we decide oh you know what it's too hard to do it this way anymore so now we're going to quit um that i find that um frustrating and insulting um so anyway before i say too much i'm going to stop thanks thank you for your comments so I, I got a message that we do have those slides that we can show um, for the, Dr. Turner's data um, as we're gathering more comments. Great, why don't we, if we can pull those up quickly, why don't we do that right now? And if not, we can go to the next question while we wait. Yep, yeah, let's keep going. Okay, uh, oh, it looks like we have a slide. Dr. Turner, do you want to walk us through, I guess, um, we looked at these before, but you can just see here on, under the death column um, where the numbers start to change uh, based on age. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is a little different than the slide that I could, okay. So it looks like this slide is um, some of the data I put together plus population appended to it. So um, just so everybody knows, the way to interpret this is that people 18 to 24 are the comparison group. And then those numbers in each of the additional age groups is, is sort of a times. So you can, so let's look at 85 plus, what you would say is there's 25 times more likelihood for them to be hospitalized um, for COVID than people 18 to 24. And it's they are almost three thousand times more likely to die from COVID nineteen compared with people eighteen to twenty four. So that's how to interpret these numbers. And Andy, the popular, yes, I'm sorry. I know you. Uh, this is Chris, and I'm sorry. Just could you clarify when you say, for example, twenty four times more likely to be hospitalized? Is that population based, or is that among cases? Among cases. Thank you. if they get COVID-19. Yep. And then you can see there, the population is on the very far right. Um, and you can see what those population estimates are for each of those groups. Excellent, thank you so much for bringing that up quickly for us. Why don't we leave this slide up here and I'll continue so folks can continue to digest the information and we'll continue to take questions and comments. Rob Giddies, go ahead, please. Sure, thank you. Um, just wanted to draw a couple of, uh, of of points here. When we're talking about this population in regards to age, um, our experience, and this is something I'll, I'll touch on a little bit during my presentation, but the if you if you open it up to an entire population from 16 to 64, the amount of people that that in, involves um, and the limited number of, uh, of appointments that are available on a daily basis for vaccines at provider locations, it's just going to frustrate uh, the the population in general much more. Um, the age based approach, so option D, it's much it's much simpler, both from a provider standpoint, but also from the general public to be able to understand when they qualify, and and the limited group would would uh, ease the the burden of those individuals that are trying to find an available appointment. Um, the appointments go in general within minutes of when when we make any available at our locations. And that's very frustrating for individuals. And I think the other thing to consider with that is the the ease of use of technology for younger generations. Um, it, they're going to be able to leapfrog and uh, and jump over that older group in that 16 to 24 um, age group, um, while the older generation definitely has a higher risk of uh, of complications from COVID. So I would I would support the comments that have been uh, been moving in that direction. And I think that that. Um, eases the, the burden for both providers and also the general public to understand when they're eligible. Thank you. 
Christine Newhoff, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Just a you know a few thoughts on, on this. Um, one, I'm I'm interested in seeing the the data if we have it on <clears throat> hospitalization and death rates uh, relative to having one or more of the conditions identified by the CDC. And <clears throat> one one uh, concern I have, and it's a little bit similar to what uh, what Mel expressed a moment ago, is that um, I think. There's, there is a reason that people with high risk medical conditions were listed before just opening it up to the general population. And uh, uh, presumably that reason is that they're at a higher risk of having a severe case of COVID. And I, um, being with a provider organization, I certainly understand that we do have issues with having the vaccinator be the person to decide, you know, does this person meet criteria? It seems to me we need to have that uh, decision further up the line at the scheduling phase or perhaps um, pre-scheduling phase. So I, I think it's worth exploring how should we go about identifying who meets these criteria if we are going to, to use the criteria. I mean, it could be by um, physician uh, uh, physicians selecting who the patients are who um, meet those criteria and need to be vaccinated early recognizing that we would need to have some process to address um, underserved populations who may not have a provider that they go to or who knows them well. So maybe looking to the agencies who work with those populations to help identify, you know, who the people with the high risk conditions are um, in those communities. And then <clears throat> uh, see within in that group, it's going to be enormous. Anyway, I think we need to have some stratification within the group. So I don't uh, I wouldn't necessarily think that we have to say you're not in group three if we're stratifying. We've stratified within group two and we've stratified within group one. I think we can stratify within group three as well and say, uh, I think I can't remember what if there was an option that had, you know, there was one that said persons 15, 50 to 64 with at least one high risk condition. Um, and maybe we follow that with people who are, um, in the next segment of age with at least one high risk medical condition so that we don't have such an overwhelming number of people uh, trying to um, get vaccinated at exactly um, at exactly the same time. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm obviously pointing out what the obvious that uh, Dr. <laughs> Turner found the other slide uh, that I believe uh, you were asking for, uh, Christy. And uh, mm -hmm. so these are the high risk medical conditions and their and their risk. And you know, a lot of what you said, I'll take a little chair's privilege here. We did discuss, um, you know, pharmacies fill prescriptions, so they would be probably aware of uh, particular conditions. Uh, uh, hospitals and doctors' offices obviously know people's medical conditions. And um, the other thing we've tried to do uh, from an honor system standpoint, and we realize the honor system is not perfect, <laughs> is post uh, when people sign up, uh, post the criteria right there. So they have to, you know, acknowledge that they have read that and before they sign up, um, basically state that they meet those criteria and those criteria could certainly be posted very, very prominently at the vaccine sites. Um, there are people that will, you know, lie on the sign up and, and blow past the signs, but there are a lot of people that I think would go, oh yeah, I don't really fit that category yet. Um, so those are some thoughts that we had as we discussed the complexities here. Um, in any case, I don't know, Dr. Turner, if you want to go over this data or just have people look at it here, but uh, these are the high-risk conditions, that, and this was a question that was asked. Yeah, um, thanks, Dr. Burgess. So um, this was uh, a slide that was presented during the January 8th meeting, um, and this was a, 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 a study um, looking at data from the Behavior Risk Factor Surveillance System and published in Clinical Infectious Diseases. Um, Without going into all of the study methodology again, um, basically, this is a summary of the demographics of cases that were included in the study. And using these data, the authors found that even when they adjusted for the presence of an individual underlying medical condition, they saw higher hospitalization rates um, for adults aged um, greater than or equal to 65 or 45 to 64 when they compared 
those two age groups to people um, aged 18 to 44. And then there's also some notes there about the fact that um, sex and um, ra certain races and ethnicities also had an impact. But this is, this is the data I think Dr. Wyatt may have been recalling was um, that even if you account for underlying conditions, um, increasing age still is, is the risk factor. Thank you very much for bringing that up quickly for us and, and clarifying some of those questions. I think we're going to move to, oh, was there a clarifying question on this yeah, one? Yeah, let me, let me just ask a, a clarifying question that's, that's, that's helpful. And, uh, you know, looking at this table, I can't really tell anything from this table except the number of people who have the conditions, you know, just, just the conclusion that's at the bottom is the only thing that really um, I think is uh, indicative of, of what you should be able to tell from this uh, data. But I guess a clarifying question is, age is still a stronger uh, indicator, it looks like it was, it was a conclusion here, um, but there's nothing that tells us how, um, say, a 40-year-old with multiple high-risk conditions uh, compares to someone with no high-risk conditions who is older than them. Right, so among people with high risk conditions, still the older ones have worse outcomes than the younger ones. Uh, but I don't know how it compares to people with no condition, I guess. And, and maybe that is also something you can tell from this data. I just uh, am asking for clarification on that front. And then just one, one final uh, comment, and that is, you know, to the extent we heard earlier that there's a consideration of maybe putting some kind of registry together, uh, might it make sense to have a registry if we go with the high risk medical conditions as a, as a category for group three, uh, would it make sense to consider putting together a registry of people with high risk medical conditions? And those would be the people who are qualified to be um, making appointments with any of the vaccinating organizations. So you would check against the registry versus you know having to um, go with the honor system at risk of having this uh, just open it up to everybody who wants to say they have a condition can say they have a condition. Thank you for those comments. Yeah, Christy, I'll, I'll uh, this is Elke, I'll add to, to that because I'm the one that brought up that registration system. Um, that The intention behind that is more of a tool where people can go and, and just sign up to be on a list to um, it, it would still be basically a self-attestation. So I don't know how we would collect, create a registry, if you will, of people with medical conditions that put them at high risk. That's not a self-attestation. Maybe others do, but I don't. I don't know how that would be possible. Yeah. Okay. This is Chris Hahn. I'm just. I'm just gonna say. I, I feel this is a little bit beyond the scope of this group, uh, but I do think something like the Health Data Exchange would be the closest thing I can think of that exists in Idaho now. Uh, p providers can go in and see records. I don't know if this would be considered a justifiable use of that, though. I think that's not something we should try to. That we have the right to kind of decide right now. But um, you know, we could take it offline and bring back some discussions about that to, at a further at a future meeting. Thank you, um, yes. Dr. Patrice. Um, so we have 13 minutes for this topic. We can yep. go over if we need to. Um, we're doing good, I think. Uh, we've we've done very well on our agenda today. Um, I do feel like we need to get a vote at least on a preference today, though, uh, because if we wait, um, there's discussions happening that uh, I, I really do think they need our input. So I'll just mention that. Thanks. Thank you so much. We have a few more hands up and then maybe we'll be ready for that first vote. Thank you. Dr. Peterman, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. Can, can you go back to the slide which shows the choices we're voting on? Yes, thank you. I have a couple of points. Uh, the first is, and I think obvious to everyone, um, we really have not addressed the issue of socioeconomic group or access to computers. Uh, and we all know if you're 85 plus, maybe you're not as good at waiting in line or accessing a computer. Um, and so I'm not saying I necessarily have that solution, but it is troublesome that what we're voting on here doesn't really uh, answer that. Again, I don't necessarily have the, the, the answer. The second is, while it doesn't cover everyone, um, and I understand there are, there are plenty of people with illnesses that don't have 
providers. But um, the advantage to uh, it being based on a combination of age and disease, or, or however, um, is that providers can direct this. And we certainly found that with the 15 to 16,000, uh, 65 plus that we did at Primary Health, uh, in that you can slow the intake in terms of saying, here's where we're at, don't call us, we'll invite you. Um, and I understand that can't be replicated everywhere in the state, but it leads to my third point, which is how important I believe it is to get vaccine, particularly when we have Johnson & Johnson, into the hands of primary care providers who are the most likely to access these groups uh, and most likely get, get to them. So if you, if you pick based on age group and you don't get this into the hands of primary care providers, then you've just set it up to be just as crazy as, as what we've just gone through. So uh, it, myself, it, it seems to me that uh, we have to have a combination of age group and, and disease, not just age group. That, that's my own preference. Thank you so much for that. Danielle Perry, please. Go ahead. Hi there. So I, yeah, I'm really struggling with this one um, because there is a lot of data and stories around um, the risks of folks that have multiple chronic conditions. So I, f I feel this weighs heavy. Can someone, maybe one of the chairs, it's been a while since we talked about this, but remind this group about our kind of our ethical matrix for decision making. Is it simply about reducing death? I, I you know, I'm sure I could find it on the website if I try, but if someone has it just really quickly, what is our ethical matrix? Like what's number one? And I think for someone like me that's really struggling with this, right, that knows that hypertension and obesity are huge contributors, if you're in your 40s and 50s, help guide us again on the ethics. Um, I'll take a stab at that, this is Patrice, and then Elke, please chime in or anybody else. So we had several considerations. It wasn't just, you know, we didn't we didn't prioritize necessarily the ethical. Uh, so one was certainly uh, disease, severe disease and death, both for the individual and also for the healthcare system. So we didn't overwhelm our system and then have to make choices on who gets a ventilator or not be able to care for people with other conditions that require an ICU. So that was certainly one. And then another one was preserving our infrastructure so that we were able to care for people and, you know, have our um, basic infrastructure uh, addressed. So those were some of the big ones. And then, of course, equity uh, that Dr. Peterman very well mentioned, you know, is, is something that was part of our core. Um, it's challenging because that really gets into the delivery of the vaccine, and we don't have a lot of ability to impact that other than to say that we, we believe equity is important. So those, there is a slide that, that lists them all out, and I think it was at the beginning even today. So did I capture most of it, or does somebody want to chime in with more? I don't know if it's possible, but I'm throwing it out there that it's slide two in this right there. Perfect. There it is, yeah. Thank you, Danielle. It's always important for us to continue to ground ourselves and align with these basic principles that we've decided as a group. So thank you so much. I'm going to go on to our next comment while we leave this up for folks to take a look at. Linda Swanstrom, go ahead, please. Thank you. And I, I did post it in the chat, um, which is that I wonder if there's another way to look at this, and that is to to take the high risk medical condition group first. And, and I agree with segregating them by age band and then just switching to a simple age band distribution for the remainder of the population. So it's kind of a hybrid on C and in the fourth choice D. Thank you for that. Does someone want to comment before I move on? All right, let's go to Mel Levitin. Go ahead, please. I just, I just want to thank Dr. Peter. I, I guess you know, I, I work with a lot of people who have uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And uh, frequently at a very young age, um, adult, but, but young adult, um, have hypertension, 
uh, reduced lung capacity, a, a variety of coexisting medical conditions aside, you know, that, that, that come along with their disability. And so, um, and, and a lot of these, a, a lot of the people that I talk to, um, you know, they've been at home for a year. Um, they're staying at home. The other concern that we haven't even brought up yet, and I realize it's because the population gets huge, um, but I think we get some public comment to the effect of um, what about what about the the family caregiver uh, for someone who has um, either a, a severe disability or a chronic health condition, um, and and that that young person uh, or that elderly person, whoever they may be, is reliant on that caregiver. Um, I mean, I again, I, I realize it's a privilege to have a, a primary care provider, but I, I do agree with, with Dr. Peterman that that's a, that's a place to start. Um, who knows who, it seems to me we're kind of pushing away one of our best, one of our best resources is the medical profession who are able to, dis, to decide based on what they know about their individual patients if they should get it or not. And, and does that mean some people are gonna push through the line? I'm sure it does, but they've been pushing through the line anyway, so okay. Um, but to just to just go clearly with an age category and take that out of the the primary health care provider who knows them or or the community health clinic that they go to, um, I, I I think that's taking away the the medical expertise of those of those um, those doctors, those physicians assistants, um, I, I think it's taking away from from all their education. Um, so I guess I I can't believe I'm saying it, but I, it seems like trusting the medical professionals um, might be might be a good idea um, rather than just doing these cold hard numbers. Um, and I, I get that the numbers are too big. But I just think, you know, we've looked all over the country and this is this is a mess, right? It's a mess. That doesn't mean it has to continue to be a mess. And and I think maybe looking at doing it differently. How can we do it differently? Um, what can we do different that would be more equitable, that would reach into those communities that that don't get that 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 don't have a doctor? What can we do? How can we help that? instead of just this is how this is the list that that we were given and this is what we have to work with i that's that's thank you thank you mel uh, uh for time I, I see lupe whistle has a comment uh go ahead please you know and i'll just make a very quick comment and i you know there's you're right this is a really tough decision because uh there's so many implications uh, but I also just want to um, add that uh, there are some folks that do not have a uh, primary care provider. And so how, where would they fit? And, and that's, you know, because uh, there are a number of people that do not have a, uh, a primary care. So that's just a comment, you know, um, because I, if, if we're going to go with a primary care provider to uh, make this decision, what happens to those folks that don't have one? That's it. Thank this you. This is Chris Hahn. I just wanted to read one thing in the chat. Dr. Dr. Wyatt. Um, and uh, hello. Can It's Chris Hahn. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Not so much? We can okay. hear you. Yep, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, no, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I can hear you. Okay, yep, I'm going ahead. Okay, uh, it's Chris Hahn. Um, and Timothy Ballard is asking, how about allowing pr participating primary care providers to provide vaccine to the high risk while other uh, pharmacies uh, and other open vaccination sites do an age-based approach since they cannot validate high-risk conditions? So the idea that different types of providers might have different criteria. Thank you for that. Yep. Yes. Um, Monica, this is Dr. Wyatt. That's exactly what I was going to say. I think if this group votes to move to an age-based approach, we're not saying that it has to be completely open 
is to let the floodgates flow. I do think that each vaccine site, including Primary Health or the other hospital systems, they've already kind of, when we opened the, the for you know the categories one and two, they went ahead and stratified that in a way to to try to access maybe to priority groups. For example, some of the hospitals they opened it up first to frontline healthcare workers on the COVID wards, and then they backed it off from there. So just because we moved to an age-based approach, I don't think that it means we can't still um, stratify based on risk and other needs. So I don't think it's an all one or all none approach. Okay, thank you. That's the last hand up I see right now, unless Danielle, you had another comment, Danielle Perry. I see your hand up still. I'm sorry, I don't. That's I okay. don't have it. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Um, is there? This is clearly not a simple decision. A lot of considerations here, and I really appreciate everybody's comments as we've been talking through this. And I'm just wondering if there's anything else, even though we're trying to focus on the live discussion, if there's anything else from the chat we need to bring forward at this time. Not at this time. Thank you so much. All right. With that, I'd like to go. Oh, I see Doc. Oh, Dr. Davids. Okay. Took her hand down. Um, all right, Dr. Burgess. We're we're so, really yeah, so I want to make a make a comment. You know, we, we can come back and revisit clarifications later and and um, we have a lot to talk about with some other uh, group three stuff, but I do think it's worth taking at least an initial vote to get a sense of where the group is leaning uh, so that the governor has that information. And then um, we're going to talk more later about um, potentially more frequent meetings. Uh, we, we are kind of on the home stretch, but we do have some pretty heavy stuff to talk about during this home stretch. So with that said, I think we have the ability to pull up a vote where you can pick A, B, C, or D, right? A polling vote. That's right. My memory. We have a poll. Um, so we're just watch um i don't know if we should i know we've it up talked right. about a lot we've talked about a lot of hybrids that that we would have to clarify later but again i think if we can just do the polling vote and pick out of these four which people lean toward um that that would at least get us you know some some direction and then again at future meetings we could do some more clarifying discussion uh within that group um so and I did want to, while we're working on the polling, I did want to clarify um, earlier we had votes that had a 28 total and then later we had a 29 total. That's because we had a member join a little bit late. So just want to make sure everybody understood that the, it was all legitimate members that were voting. Um, okay, so looking for the poll, there it is. So please um, pick A, B, C, or D and then hit submit and we will tally those up here. Patrice, while we're waiting, this is Chris Hahn, while we're waiting for people to think about this, um, you queued this up as sort of a preliminary or see how people are leaning. And I'm a little concerned, usually when we vote, that comes out in the media, it comes out in other ways as this is what how the group has voted and this is their recommendation. So uh, I wonder if we wanna be clear to the folks voting that we're going to be considering this a preliminary or a, I just want to, I'm just a little concerned because we don't usually do this and I just want to make sure everybody knows that they're comfortable. Yeah, I'm sorry if I used the wrong language. I was just saying that I think people have a lot of hybrid um, um, suggestions that are not incorporated in these four, but I still think it's important to figure out which of these four the group favors. And then if we are able to clarify within that group, once we vote for it at a future time, does that make sense? Um, so we're still voting for one of these four groups, but in our discussion, people had a sixth, a seventh, an eighth, a ninth idea. And I, I recognize that we don't have all those available. So pick the group that is closest to what you um, feel is the right thing to do. And that way we will have something to, to bring forward. And then there might be clarifications that can be made later within that group, if that makes sense. Maybe I'm making it worse, I don't know. Um, I, I guess I'd rather take a vote than not take a vote is what I'm trying to say. If we don't take a vote at all, then we're not giving any um, recommendation to people that are trying to make these decisions kind of as we speak. So it looks like we have 21 people who have responded. Oh, just a couple more, just did it. So 22, so I was just, 
give it a few more seconds before I close it. Great. So if you haven't voted yet, please go ahead and do that right now. And I think this is, um, again, while it's finishing up, this is Elke, this is definitely tough, tough decisions. Um, I'm going to echo everything that Dr. Burgess said, and we can definitely position this as CVAC just needs a little bit more time with this, and um, you're very interested in the outcome of this, and uh, I think that will be very helpful. I will close the vote now, and it will come up. Um, it, it'll give 20 seconds for anybody still doing it, and then it'll, it should pop up. Great. Thank you, Natalie. It's closed, and I'm pulling the results up now. Can you see right. that? Great, thank you. Yes, I can see it. I don't know if everyone can see it. Um, what we're seeing here, and of course, the denominators on these numbers, if you're, if anyone's seeing them, are uh, based on the all the people who are on the meeting and beyond CVAC members as well. So we're going to take the numerators. Uh, to get our sense for where we're leaning at this point in time, understanding that this is a preliminary vote. So where it lies right now is A had two votes, B had two votes, C had 11, and D has 11. Sorry, 12. Two, two, 11, and 12 at this point, getting a preliminary sense for where people are leaning on these options. And, you know, I think the reason I said it that way is because there was discussion about waiting to vote until we had more information. And I feel like we need at least a vote, um, but we can continue to work on more information. So it's pretty clear that we were we were torn between C and D with, I think, one got 12 votes, you said? Uh, 11 and 12, respectively. So 12 for D, 11 for C. That's correct. So that information will go on to the governor. Um, I don't think, I think we had a pretty robust discussion and I don't know that we have any more information that we can share to help. Um, but we did, we did land as, as we um, discussed on, on uh, D and then um, let's move. We do have, we are, I know running short on time. We do have a couple of other things, topics for discussion on another slide. And I think what we can discuss in the future is if, if D is chosen, kind of some of the comments that were made about uh, providers being able to stratify within ages, if, you know, um, based on conditions and such. So we have two more categories that um, for discussion, and these are based on some things that have been happening in other states, but also the people living in congregate settings have been brought up many times in our public comments. So not just jails and prisons, but also group homes, uh, different environments where people are living in congregate settings. And you see uh, the total number there we estimate to be around 13,000. And then um, you see some breakdowns there based on um, the different categories of uh, group living that we are um, aware of. And so um, I guess I need clarification again, Elke, because I've my brain's um, busy on the what we just did on where we were asking people to vote for these groups. Um, sorry, I was getting distracted myself. So um, with this, we were. The, the point for this was really just um, depending upon how we landed with that first round of votes was um, these are additional things that have come up. There are additional options. Um, but so I think at this particular point in time, we can just take this even as just things to consider as we because we still need to clarify kind of the basic approach. Um, so these were things like if if, for example, I'll just make up a scenario. If, for example, you had landed on um, option A in the first round of votes, it would be, you know, everyone with um, medical conditions plus essential workers. Then these subsequent votes here, for example, would be, okay, now that you voted on that approach, 
Uh, we have a clarification that's come in about people residing in congregate settings. How would you like to vote um, with this group in relation to that other? Um, and then the and then for item B, kind of similar to that. Um, that's again that goes back to you have asked us to look at what other states have done and many states have looked at people aged 50 and over living in multi-generational households as being folded into their population groups um, so this was a, a point of discussion is this a group yes or no that you would want to take up and then fold into whatever that larger group three would be so these were just how would we take these two things and put them into um, the clarifications that we did prior in group two, but it may be that it's a little premature. Yeah, I think it is premature based on the fact that we um, we technically had 12 for D um, and I know we had 11 for C, but if this was all age based, um, then these two clarifications wouldn't really matter other than <clears throat> if vaccinators wanted to subdivide within their age groups. So let's uh, tee this up for discussion in the future, but just as information for now, I think, since uh, since we did have the 12 for D. Um, you know, we are running a little short on time, but we probably do have time, I think, for a day in the life. What do you guys think? Um, if we can, I don't know how long each of your presentations are. Well, I'm wondering if we can give it a try. Uh, I think we're up at about five minutes is usually our, our direction on or our ask on those ones. Uh, because the, everything else we need to cover in our meeting. So why don't we uh, see if we can fit them in quickly and we can usually do a really quick wrap up. So Lisa, let's start with Amy and see where we get. Amy, go, Amy Gamut, please go ahead. Okay, Monica, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, go ahead, next slide. Um, so it's, it's kind of exciting to get to talk about just uh, Eastern Idaho Public Health today. So I'm just gonna look at what um, our district is doing. So the yellow there is District 7 area, um, our largest populous county being Bonneville County, and then our smallest populous county being Clark County. Um, next slide. So I won't go in a lot of detail here, just like the rest of the state, you know, our primary focus in December and January were, were really specific targeted groups. Um, a couple things to point out though, um, challenging wise as we got into some bigger groups um, was just managing the second dose no show and rescheduling um, has become a logistical nightmare um, for us and I hear that across the state um, with our teacher groups we were able to um, implement some of our larger clinics which did include a, a successful test run of a, an online link that went directly into our EMR um, teachers were able to sign up when we sent them the link directly, directly to their school district we were able to um, sign up through that and that data went directly into our EMR um, also allowed us to start developing some plans to use our, our medical reserve core um, and other volunteers in some of those larger clinics. Um, next slide. So February 1st, we were, we were anticipating and, um, and very excited as well to add the 65 plus um, age group. We, we knew there would be some things we'd have to change. Um, you know, the high demand, limited vaccine messaging and um, scheduling. We did adjust our, our scheduling to um, use our online link as well um, for about 60% of our appointments and then did some phone calling for about 40% of our appointments. Um, it was a, a different process. We, we went live the, I guess the Saturday before February 1st with that. Um, and in about 20 minutes through phone calls and through our link, um, we had over 2,000 appointments scheduled. Um, and, and I will admit the first 20 minutes was very exciting. Um, people were excited to get through. It was the, the next, I don't know, 20 days <laughs> that had to impact after that. So after that, um, you know, 20 minutes of scheduling, our phones continued to ring um, so much that it even aired out our, our system that takes off those messages. We couldn't get them off fast enough to tell them that appointments had been um, filled. So we, we knew we needed to look at something different down the road, and I'll talk about that um, in a minute. Uh, on the good side, though, February 1st, we did have a successful kickoff of the 65 plus um, here in Bonneville County. We did a, a clinic with about um, just under 740 vaccinations given. Um, that was 24 staff and volunteers over about a nine hour um, day. It was mostly the 65 plus population. 
Um, we had a, a little bit smaller space than what we wanted, so we had some creative um, thinking. We were able to do paperwork out in the car, so we were able to give them paperwork in the car and then bring them um, through the clinic. Our largest clinic since then has been over a thousand people um, in a day, and, and, and they've been very well. Um, we're, we're able to accommodate both the social distancing um, and the, the 15 minute waiting after work, so both very successful. Um, next slide. Um, so that's brought us to what I what I was kind of asked to talk about today um, is what we're doing for scheduling scheduling now. Um, and I know somebody referred to it as lottery. We we don't like that term. Not very many people win in the lottery. We look at it as more of um, playing bingo until everybody wins. So that's our our kind of our process um, through it. So we had started a notification notification list early in December. Uh, people could sign up for that notification list, and we would let them know when their priority group was up. Um, so after this February 1st date, we did start to create an actual wait list. Um, we invited people um, to sign up on that wait list um, through February 11th. Um, on the 11th, we did combine that wait list with our prior notification list. Um, they duplicated it, um, sorted it randomly through Excel, um, took off you know, the 3,000 people that we'd either already administered vaccine to um, or had scheduled um, ended up with around 10,000 individuals. And so on the 11th, you know, we had started calling, calling people to schedule appointments. Um, again, that took a while. And uh, the very next day, we, we changed a little bit in our process as well. Um, it took a long time to reach out to individuals just going from down a list, um, especially trying to connect with them, waiting for them to call back. And so we moved towards something that we've done with our influenza clinics for several years where we're able to you know, take a, a group of numbers and send out a call or text and invite people to call us back to schedule an appointment. Um, and that became much more successful. And, and people are, are enjoying, I mean, they're, they're good with that process as well. They're able to call in at their convenience, schedule their appointment. Um, and then it allows us to do some pre-screening prior to the appointment as well. Um, one thing that we're, we're learning that we wanna do is confirm that first and second dose appointment at the same time. So we're confirming that you're able to make both those appointments or we move them into a next clinic. Um, and then we found the biggest deferral um, during the actual clinic was for people that had received a vaccine in the past two weeks. And so we're also asking that in that pre-screening process and then scheduling them out farther if we need to. Um, then as of yesterday, and I, I haven't checked today, but we're about um, two thirds through our list. We're hoping to finish that um, by tomorrow. Um, we're starting to see some counties lists completely called. Um, and then we're still inviting people even after this um, to still, still submit to a wait list. Um, next slide. And this is just our online version. Um, people could also call and sign up and then our staff would just go in and sign them up as well. So this is what's on our website right now on the left where they're able to, after we get through this list, we'll just continue to schedule people out. Um, if you put your, you know, currently we're looking at 60, this is the 65 plus. We also have another one for other prior, current priority groups. Um, this one, if you're 62, won't allow you to go on, um, would force you to go um, to the other priority group spot and put your priority group. And then on the right, it's just a picture of our, our kind of our call center that's um, taking those calls and um, scheduling those appointments. Um, next slide. And so just some concerns and thinking ahead. Um, it's just the 65 overlap with the next priority group. And I mean, we don't know what that looks like yet, but if we're still heavily involved with that and then looking at other large groups are a concern, um, still the logistics of the second dose rescheduling and no shows still continues to be a, a problem in our clinics. Um, this week, we're, we're now learning how to adjust with uh, vaccine shipping delays. Um, and then I kind of already talked about the smaller counties priority groups also being completed. You know, some of our smaller counties um, were clearly going to be through 2.2 um, before we are our larger counties. And then 2.3, and I guess as we sit here today, we don't even know what uh, what 2.3 or even on, you know, in the future looks like. I, I do think there is a place for our link um, when we move to maybe some of these other populations again. Um, it definitely was very efficient, even though it definitely had some flaws. And so we're looking at how we can incorporate that um, in the future as well. Um, next slide. 
and this is just some pictures, um, you know, throughout the last, you know, two months, um, some in our long-term care facilities that we went out, some in our clinic in our office, um, and then some of the, you know, the bigger clinics that we've set up. And that's the end of it. Thank you, Thank Amy. Thank you so much. Um, we have we have decided there's been a little dis, uh, discussion on um, deferring uh, Rob's presentation till the next meeting, and I know Monica needs to do our closing remarks. I just want to let everybody know we've read all the comments in the chat. We understand that there were a lot of votes that that did think chronic conditions were important. And so we have a foundation here from what you guys have told us that we can bring to you for further votes. We just wanted to get that initial vote done so we could get a sense of where we needed to do some refinement. And so um, I think that leads us pretty well into closing remarks because we do think we need to meet more frequently. And also um, I wanted to give uh, an update that, um, or at least somebody wanted to give an update that we do think our, our vaccines are arriving, I think Monday and Wednesday uh, with the weather delay. So that's exciting news. So I will go to Monica for closing remarks and we'll get some more clarification votes into you guys to clear up some of that concern that you have in the chat. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Burgess. So we covered an awful lot today. It was a very robust discussion. And clearly, as Elke mentioned, and we've all been all recognized, these are very challenging decisions. So I just, again, want to thank everyone for the, the conversation, um, acknowledging the difficulty of these decisions, and then incorporating all the different pieces of information, the data, the public input, all of your respective knowledge and expertise. And, and that's how we get the best outcome. But it's not an easy process. But certainly a good, robust process. So we'll continue those discussions. Uh, we've talked about um, where we are in the clarifications around the, the groups we've already voted on. We heard our progress updates on the national and state levels, including some new pieces that Elke shared with us. Um, and then we spent, of course, a, a big portion of our meeting talking about the approach to our next vaccination group as we, and just to affirm one more time, initial conversations, initial votes and clearly we'll need some more there as we move forward. So um, just checking my notes here if I missed anything. Thank you, Amy, for your presentation today. And Rob, thank you for graciously agreeing to defer your presentation from what I understand until next time. So thank you for that. Uh, so action items and next steps. I think we got through all of our votes today. So we don't have any specific voting in between meetings, which will be helpful. Our next meeting is officially scheduled for March 5th from 12 to 2 and then March 19th. So continuing on that two week cadence, uh, I think that is all I have before I'd like to turn it over to Elke and Dr. Burgess one more time in case they have any final comments for us. Um, but I just want to again, thank staff, all CVAC members, of course, voting ex officio, everyone, our ASL interpreters, thank you so much. That's a tough job. Um, and uh, just everyone who's contributed to the success of this meeting. And with that, I'd just like to turn it back over to Elke and Dr. Burgess. Thank you. I'll go next because I want to uh, I can't even speak anymore. I'd like to do a big shout out to Dr. Burgess because this is not an easy job and we really appreciate walking us through all of that. And I also want to have a, a message of don't despair. Um, I know that that was stressful um, and trying to manage this next group. And as, as Monica said, you know, we kind of teed it up that it was going to be a hard conversation to have. Um, but, you know, we want to make sure that we um, honor the, the work that you all are doing. Um, definitely, as I uh, give the governor his update on the votes that we, we did make it through, um, give him the spirit of the conversation that we had today so it's very clear that um, more time is needed to really be thoughtful about our next steps and be strategic. So uh, we will, um, I felt like it was great hearing this conversation despite despite it being a little um, unclear to everyone because it, get, it did give us a good flavor of what you're all, what you are thinking about, um, how we could better kind of package things up for you to bring them forward. Um, and I really encourage all of you, if you have additional input that we haven't already captured in the chat, please reach out to us and let us know um, if you have ideas, maybe how to structure different options for voting uh, for next time. That would be really helpful. We gave you some teasers um, and <laughs> what we could with the information that we had. So for me, I still think this was incredibly valuable. And Elke, yeah, just I would echo that. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Just a quick question, Elki. Do, would you like any of those suggestions on how to structure and whatnot coming in through the same email box that's uh, for our CVAC members? Correct. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. So yeah, I'm just going to echo that. You know, uh, we had a lot of discussion about some hybrid type things. So email those in, and then we can get those teed up for you. Um, because we just had to give you at least something to vote on. But uh, if you have some more fine tuning, that we could, we'd love to hear those suggestions. And thanks, everybody. I know we're a couple minutes over, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Words you. Too. Bye. See you next time. Monica, I do have one extra question if you can hang on for a minute. Yep, I'm here. Thanks. And thank you, Misty, for confirming. I didn't have a chance to chat back to you, but confirming how many voting members we had. Thank you. Yeah, and I did keep, um, so that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, number one, I didn't hear you because I was getting the attendance when you said who was standing in for whom. Okay. Um, so if you can tell me that, and then um, for, um, I hope Angela's still on. I am going to put this in my email to you, but I do have um, 